Would you like an opinion on a financial matter you're dealing with? Whether it's about retirement, investments, taxes, or 401ks, Scott Hansen and Pat McLean would like to help you by answering your call to join Allworth's Money Matters. Call now at 833-99-WORTH. That's 833-99-WORTH. Welcome to All Worth Money Matters. I'm Scott Hansen. I'm Pat McLean. Thanks for joining us as we talk about financial matters. Both myself and my co-host here, we're both financial advisors, certified financial planner, chartered financial consultant. We spend our weekdays meeting with people like yourself, helping them with their plan their finances in the future, and come here uh, broadcast anyway on the weekends to be your financial advisors on the air. Our whole goal and, ob- and objective with this program is to educate you so you make wiser decisions when it comes to your finances. And uh, we believe it's a worthy goal for having to have some financial independence where uh, work becomes an option and not an obligation. Retirement's a possibility for those that um, want that and actually just some little more flexibility in life. And a lot of that comes down to, a great deal comes down to financial disciplines. Yeah, personal responsibility. Do you, remember, investments? do you remember how that works? Personal responsibility? Do I remember how it works? Uh, uh, just listening, well... Does society remember personal responsibility? No one talks about that anymore. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's a strange time, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, everything's someone else's fault. Oh, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Everyone knows his fault. Personal responsibility. And that's yeah, what personal yeah, yeah. finance is all about. Obviously, the word personal, personal responsibility, you're, you're responsible it for your It is so own interesting. You know, we, future. we've been doing, we've been advisors for 30 plus years. We've... Both in person, there was a time when I had a few hundred plus clients, uh, and well, they didn't leave us. No, no, no. Someone else in the firm, the firm works okay, with they're them. Still part of the firm. Thank you. <laughs> um, I was the primary advisor. I still have relationships with many of them. But uh, we have talked with thousands of people over the years through this radio program, through other venues we've been in. And what is always interesting to me is at at let's say retirement age, let's call it sixty five or whatever. There is a little correlation between one's income and one's retirement uh, readiness. Yes. Very little correlation. Now, every once in a while, there's the person who's, who made a fortune just either through their career because the company's stock options or something kind of got lucky. They tend to be an exception. But otherwise, you can see someone who's made family's incomes a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. They get to retirement. There's no way they're prepared for it. You see other people whose family income is 60000 a year. They get to retirement, homes paid off, ready to go. I mean, it's really amazing. It is. It's actually, it's, uh, it's what, what the difference is, is how people re- relate to their own spending patterns. It's spending patterns even more than investing patterns. Yes, it's spending patterns. It's the, those willing to actually, and by the way, when you're investing, it's a store of wealth. So you always hear the story of this guy got rich because he picked this stock or that stock They're or they an bought anomaly. Bitcoin or they bought Tesla when it was three it's cents. It's an anomaly. Or, it's an anomaly. For most people, when you invest your retirement savings, it is a way for you to store your wealth. What is a store of wealth? Well, for most, most people, it's a store of labor. You have taken your labor, you traded it for money. Some of that money you got back in the trade, you put in a savings account. The government encourages it by putting tax favorable treatment on much of this. And then that is how you stored your labor is through capital markets or lending. Capital markets are equities. Capital markets can be other things or lending, which is bank CDs or bonds. Yep. Yeah. When I explain this, I've taught in a number for the day, by the way, high school classes. I've taught for a day or two in That's high school. That's painful. Not a whole day. Not a whole day. Just a couple hours. I don't think I could do much more than a couple hours. Um, but as I like to explain God it, bless high school teachers. Oh and maybe more so middle school teachers. <laughs> Actually, I ran into a high school teacher the other day. He was telling me, he was, I, I said, thank you for your service. And I thought, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, but lending money is bonds, CDs, you're lending money. And Ownership is when you own a physical asset, real estate, or stocks. Ownership versus loanership. Thank and that the, does sound good for high school students. A good diversified portfolio will have both in there. Unfortunately, most high school students graduate with very little in the way of personal finances. And the, per, the financial classes they have tend to be stock picking uh, contests, which 
It's so foolish. It's, well, how does that? Well, which is which is we saw in the last couple of weeks. Fidelity now has made stock trading free from twelve to seventeen year olds with parental consent. Yeah. Yeah, 12 to 17 with parental. Fidelity is in just about every area of the financial services and wealth management, right? So they have that sort of thing, which I would kind of scratch my head out and like, is this helpful? Yeah, what, what are we Maybe trying to they do? think it's an educational process for their future clients, customers. Yeah. Um, I don't know. That's kind of one end of the spectrum, and they do a bunch of I'm not, I'm not going to say they're a good or bad company. They just are. Um, they just are a company. They are a company. Anyway. Uh, if you'd love to, if you'd like to be part of our program, we'd love taking our, your calls, answering questions that you bring to us, and our contact number to be part of our program eight three three ninety nine worth. That's eight three three triple nine six seven eight four, and we'd love to take your question. We're going to start here with Robert. Robert, you're with All Worth Money Matters. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thank you. Hey, um, I got a couple questions. Um, a little background first. I have a financial spreadsheet. I call it my retirement plan that covers everything that I can think of. It runs out to the age of 100. And I lean towards a conservative nature. So most of the assumptions in it are, are conservative. Like what? Just and, as an example, like what's a growth assumption? What's an inflation assumption? Inflation, 3%. Uh, 401 growth, 2%. My social security gets decremented by 15%. Because of the okay, you are received. conservative. So you're assuming that your retirement assets are going to lag inflation by 1%, yeah. or is that a 2% real return added on to that inflation number? No, sir, the, the first. Okay, uh, all right. Yeah. I would call it the yeah. doomsday spreadsheet, <laughs> quite frankly, Robert. <laughs> but no, he's probably thinking, what if, I'm what if I'm on fixed income yes, the rest yes. of my life, right? Well, yeah, I, I um, set my premature retirement at the age of 55, I spent a lot of time looking at my spreadsheet now. You are retired? I am retired, okay. yes. So I guess in, in my question is, in your opinion, is my financial situation or my spreadsheet, my retirement plan, does it seem solid and appropriate enough to last 40 years? If what you're stating is you are assuming your portfolio is going to lag inflation by 1%, you're assuming that uh, Social Security is going to decline in r real returns, real numbers by 15%, and you have enough dollars to last you to your age 100, I would say you are, uh, I don't know how much more uh, we can increase probabilities of outcome. How much, how much money, uh, how much as a percentage of your 401k is in equities? Uh, not much anymore. I got a little, uh, that's my problem. I think I'm getting... Too emotional. You know what? Here's the, here's one of the challenge. How long have you been retired? Um, almost six years now. Okay, but when you think back to your working days, retirement was a thing in the future. You were saving money every month, kind of like putting wood on the wood pile, right? Every month you're saving right. money. Uh, you're busy working, so you've got a daytime thing that's keeping you busy, uh, and your your account's growing just by the nature of you continuing to add to it. You suddenly move into retirement. One of the things is you've got plenty of time on your hands, right? So you've got plenty of time to click on and say, what's my account look like today? We're no longer adding to that wood pile. Now we're pulling the, the logs off, right? Each month we're taking some, some money out. So we're not, we're not having any growth any longer because unless the markets do something for us because we're having some sort of withdrawals. And, and it can get a bit all-consuming. And, and frankly, the more you look at it, the more you study it, you're, it probably does not lead to better decisions. Yeah. How old are you today? I will be 61 in August. 61 years of age. Okay. Yeah. How much of your portfolio, you said you don't have much in equities. How much do you have in equities? I have, as of yesterday, I have 8%. Okay. And do you have any other weird asset class, gold or Dogecoin no. or something? And how much money uh, do you have saved for retirement? Uh, 1.4. Okay. So you've got 8% of, so approximately $110,000 in equities out of this 1.4%, correct? Correct. Okay. Did you know, going back to 1925, according to Ibbotson's, there's never been a 15-year period where equities, the broad stock market measured by the S&P 500 index, has not outperformed the uh, bonds. And you're talking. Even if you bought 
in 1929 at the top of the market. So if you're 61 and you're trying to plan to live age 100, there's a huge chunk of your dollars that you're not even going to touch for 20 years. So that's exactly where I was going with this, Scott, is the, the, the problem is not the portfolio, it's you. It's you because of how you view the world. So you've got this bunker mentality, but you can get to the same place. And I've done this. Look, I'll tell this story with a, a client. They had more money than they were ever going to spend in their lifetime. They had sold a business and more money than they were ever going to spend in their lifetime. And I put them in a 50-50 portfolio, right? 50% stock, 50% bonds and cash. Exactly the opposite of kind of what happened with you. And he, the, the client and his wife kept pushing me to get more equities in the portfolio. And I said, you know, we can put more equities in the portfolio, but the reality is you're going to react negatively in that portfolio in a down market. And if you change the model or allocation anywhere in a down market, you've actually defeated yourself. He said, I know I might do that. What do we do about this? I said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a third of your portfolio and we're going to put it in a separate account. We're going to take your IRA and we're going to move two thirds to an account that you will watch on a daily basis, which is fine. And I'm going to take a third of the account and I'm going to put it in this other account and we're going to go 100% stocks in this, 100% equities. You cannot ask me questions about it. We can't talk about it. We're going to pretend it doesn't exist. How long ago was this? Four years ago. Okay. And it's done great. Obviously. It's done great. And the reason we did that was to remove the psychological uh, barriers to the portfolio. I said, this money is going to be inherited by your children. So we don't care what it does on a day-to-day basis. We care what it's worth in 15, 20, 25 years from now. Now, with Robert, it might be, I care what this is worth when I'm 75. That's right. Or 80. Or 80. So if you have to do it that way, do it that way. If you were my older brother, I would be pounding you. to. I would just say, this is just stupid. But you're not my older brother, and I've never met you, so I can't say that. Um, You can. Don't worry. (laughs) So, Robert, you know exactly what the answer is. You you said you're your own worst enemy. Wasn't that the word you used? I, well, I didn't use that, but no. I think I'm becoming that. Yes. Okay. So this is this is so classic. And you're uh, was, uh, Jeremy Grantham said that the the number one risk to investors is themselves. Something along those lines. It, he's one of the famous uh, uh, investors hundred years ago or whatever it was. The, the, the challenge is it's not easy being an investor because we are emotional humans. And, and we're designed to protect ourselves from things that are scary. We, we, we run away from, from things that might hurt us. I mean, if the pandemic hasn't shown anything, it's that. Something that the death rate is very small on a kind of a global basis, but scared, the, scared everybody, right? I mean, it's, so we are designed by nature to, to hide, to protect ourselves, to uh, avoid any sort of, any sort of risk. And in, in, when you invest, you need to embrace some of that. You need to be ex- you need to be comfortable with some of the ups and downs. That's why it's so hard to be an investor. Long Scott, term. I would I would argue the other fact that Robert has exposed himself to more risk by not having Correct. equities in the portfolio by not what having more. What if inflation more is five percent or six percent? Yeah, you in oh, an inflationary okay. environment, you want to own the thing that causes the thing. You want to own <laughs> equities in an inflationary environment or real estate. So let let me, okay, that was one of my questions as well. I've got two rentals in California, and in my plan, I assume that I sell one of them when I'm 66, 67, and the other one when I'm 70. But given the real estate market today and the fact that real estate tends to be a good inflation hedge, should I I sell it or should I not? You know, it's classic. So you were thinking about selling it. Suddenly the asset price went way up in value, and now you're thinking about not. <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> so, right? I mean, I'm not gonna, we're not going to answer that question, uh, what you should do in the next several and, years. And actually, I wouldn't state. worry about it. I actually wouldn't. I wouldn't ha- even have it on my agenda if, to if, sell if a you were property. 60, if you were planning on it at 66 or 67 and you were 65 today, we'd say sell it now. Not that we, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. All we know is the real estate market's been on fire in much of the country 
and the opportunity to sell is just tremendous right but now. if it pops up on your calendar at 65 and you say this is the day i need to you, you know i quite frankly robert you would you would benefit from some professional financial advice mostly so that uh you could blame or uh, <laughs> someone else for anything well, well that's okay. helpful I, I got a question. Okay, so, you know, I've had a few adult drinks, and I did some self-reflection and from a financial perspective, and I've been considering a financial advisor. But now, how do I know they can do better than me? And you don't. Will the, will, will the benefit outweigh the cost? That's right. How would I ever know? That's right. Well, first of all, I can tell you most financial advisors could do better than you. Assuming that they can help guide you. Assuming that you'll take their and advice. I'm convi- and we're going to have to wrap here in just a moment. Robert. But I'm convinced. I've been doing this 30 years. 30, I, the, the greatest value that I have brought to clients over the years, typically families, typically, well, it's People either like husband yourself. or wife. Or it's a, someone who's been widowed or a single person. The greatest value I've added is keeping people from making mistakes from which they cannot recover. And that part of it is, is when the markets are going uh, cra- unbelievably well, people want to buy more and buy at the wrong times. And when markets are going horrible, they have some. They want to run for the hills and sell out everything. And it's those times when they make decisions based in those periods of times. Often they, they can do things that are irrevocable to their their finances. So we, we need to wrap here, uh, Robert, but I, I, I will leave you with this. You should have no less than 35% of your portfolio in equities. No less, no less. How you do that, it's up to you. If you hire an advisor, they would actually probably push you to get 50% of the portfolio in equities because you have enough money that you could actually do distributions and never t- touch the equity side of the portfolio for 15 years, easily. Yeah. So you need, at a minimum, if you want to take anything away from this call, it's I need to get at least a third of my portfolio in equities. Yeah, I'm glad you called. Call. Yeah, you obviously done some good job uh, planning. He and reflected I, on over a couple adult beverages. <laughs> is what he said. Usually, you don't make the best decisions. <laughs> by the way, <laughs> <laughs> we've always had a no alcohol policy in the office. Yeah, in part because I would not that I'd expect many of employees to be in by, taking advantage in the middle of the day, but. That's the last thing I want to do is mix that up with uh, investing decisions. Yeah, and it's, 19, it's not 1972 anymore, <laughs> which is why there's no I, alcohol. I keep the, the scotch locked up in the... Uh, <laughs> like, like it's what ma- they call those little things they used to kind of... Oh, the rolling yeah, the, yeah, bar right. carts? Oh, my god! It's not like it's Mad Men. No. All right. Anyway, uh, let's continue getting on calls here with... Uh, let's talk to Kathleen. Kathleen, you're with Allworth's Money Matters with Scott Hansen and Pat McClain. Hi, guys. Hi, Kathleen. I have an HSA question. All right. I have a, about $4,000 in my HSA, and I don't use those funds much other than covering my copay for one biannual wellness appointment and when contact lenses or glasses exceed my benefits. I have no chronic conditions, and I don't take monthly medications. I contribute about 2500 each year to cover my maximum deductible. I'm working full time and approximately three years from my planned retirement. How old are you? So recently, I'm uh, 64 in two weeks. All right. I recently directed about $500 to be invested in that Fidelity Health Savings Fund, Class K. Okay. Because it seemed to have low risk and it's a no fee. It was a no fee transaction. So was that a good choice? Did I invest too much, too little? Well, I'm not sure how their K thing works, but it it depends on investments come down to a couple of things. One is when are you going to need the money? And for example, if, if you've got money set aside that you plan on, on um, buying a vacation home in two years, well, the last thing you want to do is put it anywhere that's got any volatility. You want to have it somewhere nice and safe and, and sound. Uh, so that's one of the things. The other is is how much can you kind of tolerate for ups and downs. We had a previous caller that couldn't tolerate much ups and downs, very conservative. So if, you, if you're like, well, that, some fluctuations don't bother me much, then it really comes down to when do you think you will withdraw the money from that account? The way I use my HSA, I've never withdrawn a dollar from it. So I've got a family HSA, high deductible. Every year I put the maximum into it uh, through my employer. It goes to, I think they choose some company it goes to. And then when it get, builds up in a big enough balance, I transfer it to a another institution where it's invested 100% stocks. I'm 54 years old. It's 100% stocks. I don't plan on touching it 
until government forces me to touch it, whenever that might be in the future, there'll be some changes by the time I'm an old so man. So the, the answer to the question isn't let's forget what you did with the money because you put it in, you said, a Fidelity K fund. I don't know what that is. I assume that you said it doesn't have much risk. I assume it's mostly bond. The question is, should you be putting more in and should you dr- – be directing it more aggressively and then paying for those deductibles out of pocket. Yes. Right. So are you putting the maximum into your 401k? Yes. And are you saving money well, on? I think I am. Okay. Well, that's, I, f- I'm putting my, my maximum deductible per year. Okay. But the, you're putting the maximum the law allows. But one could 401k. certainly argue that the, you do the step of maximum where you get the, the, the match and, and, and then you move to the HSA, and then you go back to additional pre-tax contributions. And I would agree with that argument. This, if you were highly disciplined yeah, and I don't mapped get all that out. <laughs> What's yeah. that? Yeah, I don't, I don't get matching funds on the HSA, okay. but I do on my 401k. Yeah, understand. So, 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 so the basic point is, the simple way, is you actually put the 401k into the maximum, and then you actually fund your H- 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 HSA – and I would go with the same allocation in the 401k uh, and the HSA. I'd have one in the same because the timeline oh. will be similar. And then I would pay for my deductible expenses out of pocket. Okay. And it's contrary would, to what the industry yeah, kind of pushes because I've got HSA and they send me, tell me things and here's, they want me to get a credit card with it or debit card it. of some sort. And uh, look, uh, it, Scott is doing it right. I am doing it wrong. My wife wants to pay for the co-pay out of the HSA. I bet, Pat, you've told this story before, but your wife's an accountant. I bet if you went to a little spreadsheet, not that you're the master of Excel spreadsheets. I could do one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you do a little spreadsheet. <laughs> Honey, here's what the HSA, here's why my reason behind this. She would say, oh, that makes sense. Okay. Okay, Scott, you're it's right. It's probably more so that this is her part of the partnership that she takes care of. She does a great job. And once you start messing with the way she's doing it, then suddenly you're brought into the whole thing. And then that, 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 that's right. So I've been married (laughs) 35 years. I, out of all the things that I need to fix in my marriage, the HSA (laughs) is really (laughs) way down on the list, but that's how you want to do it. Kathleen is you want to actually take those dollars, pay for the deductible and, and invest it aggressively or is at the same risk level as your 401k yep. and pretend it's okay. part of your retirement savings. Okay. Yeah. Cause I was thinking of it as a savings account for future medical. Expenses. That's how I view mine. Yeah. Actually the, okay. the way I look at it is the more tax deductible, uh, uh, in investments I have, then I can avoid paying taxes. The, the longer, better. the better. Particularly if there's no required minimum distributions on them, which is it's not. a strange thing. And if it's used for medical expenses, there's no taxes on the growth. I don't think. And that- I assuming that my life is going to go like a lot of people's, where I'm going to have much greater medical expenses in my latter years. Yeah, you were treated for poison ivy this week for falling off your bike into a poison ivy. Oh, then I, I tell you, I get bad poison. <laughs> Thank oak you for the call, years. by the way, Kathleen. I get bad. Poison oak about every ten. There's poison oak all around where we oh, live. Poison oak, not poison ivy. Yeah, poison I oak. wouldn't know what poison ivy looked like. I'd be in big trouble because it's the same. And about every ten years, I'm stuck. I have to go to the doctor and get a shot of some steroid and get on prednisone because. And so this was last week, and I'm I'm on my mountain bike. I do I like to mountain bike. And same day, some lady told me I need to slow down. But anyway, that's another story. So I come <laughs> around the corner, and another guy right on this bush coming. We're about ready to hit each other head on. So I get off the trail, I go to put my foot down, it's on an embankment, and I roll right into a poison oak bush. I mean, it's all around me. I'm like, oh, this is bad. Do you go home and shower immediately? Oh, yeah. And, and I use tech new. Well, I finished my ride. Okay. <laughs> I had to clear the head, too. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. <laughs> I knew you finished the ride. <laughs> I had a choice. <clears throat> and um, it, within hours, I'm starting to itch. I go to the doctor the next morning. He's like, oh, man, with not even 24 hours, you're already having this breakout? This is pretty pretty bad. So um, I have not been sleeping well because as much as the prednisone's helping, it's not. Uh... How old are you? I'm 54. <laughs> and then I'm going to be complaining about how hard my life is. <laughs> uh, our dog was neutered yesterday, our puppy. We got a uh, puppy a few months ago. Okay. And some my wife felt bad for him, so he, he was able to sleep on the bed last night. You, so cone. your dog got neutered and your wife let it sleep on the bed. <laughs> so neither none of us slept oh, last night. You are making husbands across the United States look bad by He's actually... A, 
He's a cute little dog, though. He's so much. He's a good dog, and he'll be better when he doesn't. When he just passed this, and oh, I tell you what, I don't care what you did to my dog; it would never sleep on my bed with me. I don't care. I mean, he, he's, he's a little he, eighteen-pound dog. I don't care. I don't care. If I was just, actually the one who suggested that he get, leaves his crate like, a few weeks ago and hops up in the bed. I don't care. All right. <laughs> You're looking at me like I'm nuts. <laughs> what? It's not a great Dane for crying out loud. We're not He's living little, in the uh... woods. The dog isn't protecting your household against invaders where you have to have it sleep in your bed, which was the original intent of the dog anyway. <laughs> no, but he's... <laughs> they were man's alarm clock. That's what the dogs... Basically how they got domesticated is to warn people. You, no one's coming into your bedroom at night that the dog needs oh, to be he's sleeping scared. on the 18 bed. 18 pounds of watch out. Uh, we're taking a quick break. We will be back with more All Worth Money Matters. Can't get enough of Allworth's Money Matters? Visit allworthfinancial.com slash radio to listen to the Money Matters podcast. Welcome back to Allworth's Money Matters. Scott Hansen. Pat McClain. And uh, we're talking about financial stuff here well, I, today. You know, I, you know what I wanted to talk about? Oh, let's give our phone numbers out in case anyone likes to join our show. Or join the show. 833-99-WORTH. That's 833-999-999. Six seven eight four, and you can actually call at any time. And um, even if we're off the air, and we'll schedule time for you to visit with us when we're on the air. So, um, and by the way, if you like this program, um, we'll ask you a couple things. One is give us a review on this Apple or Spotify or wherever you listen to it. And if you think it's helpful. Uh, forward this on to a friend. Take one of the episodes that you found particularly helpful for yourself and you think, I thought my buddy would like this. Um, Forward that on to your friend. We'd appciate that. And that is completely self-serving, Scott, but we would appreciate if our listeners would do that. It's not completely self-serving. I think people... People benefit from this program. Oh, I would hope. Oh, I guess it's not completely self. It's, it's a little self. Yeah, of course it's a little self serving. Yeah. Most of the things I do in my life are self serving. <laughs> I'm honest with myself. Well, most people's lives. Yes, I wake up. I'm thinking about myself. Yeah, yeah. And it's yeah. like, oh, I forgot. I got a wife. I got a kids. Okay, was that what you're like? What does that hit you around ten thirty in the morning? <laughs> Some days. <laughs> I'm like, oh wait. <laughs> Where's my breakfast? <laughs> it's, not, it's not the Scott show. <laughs> All right, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, this. Came out. It was an article co-authored authored by Robert Jackson who used to be the Securities and Exchange Commission member. Oh, gosh, this stuff gets right? so, it's just frustrating. And uh, he is now a professor at New York University School of Law, and he recently co-authored a study on financial advisors who commit misconduct under one regulator, and then they operate under a different regulator once they lose their license. So financial advisors, the whole group of people that are giving out some sort of financial advice, think of three broad regulatory regimes. There's the Securities and Exchange Commission, they register, I mean, they, they regulate fee-based advisors, fee-only financial advisors. They regulate registered investment advisory firms, firms like Allworth, and there's other number of firms out there. That's what they're responsible for regulating. And then also, a lot of the big brokerage firms, they still have to kind of come through, through them. But there's also an independent regulator called FINRA, the Financial Industry Reporting Organization, is that what it is? Regulatory. Uh, regulatory. Yeah. Okay. FINRA. FINRA is responsible for brokers. Think of the old traditional Wall Street brokers. They have a securities license to sell securities. Uh, and then outside of that, there are state insurance departments that have their own licensing to sell insurance products. Oftentimes, an advisor might be regulated by all three of those entities. There's a fourth one you missed, which is small investment advisory firms. Registered investment advisory firms you. that can be regulated by just the state and not the SEC. But here's what happens. And this the, the name of this paper was called Wandering Financial Advisors. And it looked at the history of brokers that are regulated or investment advisors that are regulated under the Securities Exchange Commission that lost their licenses where they went. 
These are people who lost their license. Lost their license. You got to kind of screw up to lose your license. You got to do something really, really bad to lose your license. You got to be a bad, bad person to lose your license. They looked at the people that lost their license. Like, where did they go afterwards? Are they pool cleaning company, right? Doing are they, are they running Uber a, driver? Are they running a car wash? Where did most of them end up? They ended up as insurance agents of one form or another. Oftentimes, selling life insurance and annuities, including indexed annuities, because These index equity index annuities, equity index annuities are regulated under the insurance regulators, not the SEC. And so, why this is important to you is that, again, you've heard us say it a dozen times. Go to the broker check database. Anyone you're doing business with financially. Put their name into broker Just check. Go, all you got to do is Google broker check. No matter who it is. Who or everyone, Bing. Either Bing or Google broker check. No, no one gives Bing. I'm, 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 you I'm don't going, use Bing. I'm going to. I, I, all I know this is because actually our marketing people get a lot more leads out of Bing than they do. Is that the one Google. that's owned by Microsoft that comes yes. as a default and you got to change it? And, yes. And they upgrade it and then it's back again. And it's like, how do I, where'd my Google go? <laughs> well, we're off the subject now, but go back to broker check. Look, search broker check, put the person's name in. It will tell you what regulatory history this, this person's have. And if there's been any sort of reprimands, um, violations, suspensions, revocations. And I've seen in, in so we broadcast the Sacramento region for, we've been broadcasting 26 years. The same radio station we were on, there was a, a gentleman, a man I should call him, who was disbarred for like five years uh, from, he lost his securities license. He dropped his security license, no longer registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission, and no longer registered with FINRA, I should say. Acted like he's a fee-only advisor, but was really selling a bunch of equity index annuities. The Securities and Exchange Commission filed suit against him. I think they're probably going to make an example out of him because it was... It's the right hand doesn't know what the left hand. It does. was pretty. There's egregious. another one. This guy lived on the same street of my previous neighborhood. He lived ten doors down, fifteen, twenty years ago when I lived in that neighborhood, and just a few years ago he was he got he stole like a one point eight million dollars from some seniors. He had dropped his securities license. Something happened. No longer had a securities license. Still built himself as a financial advisor. Not licensed with anybody any longer. Nobody supervising him working out of who knows what as a bedroom or something and was bilking investors. So these are two examples in our own geography and where if, if someone people had just, checked, just broker check at put the person's name there, it's going to tell you, hello, like this is a bad guy. Don't do business with them. So regardless of the investments that someone is pitching you, check, check the broker. Look, check. And I, by my nature, I am a trusting person. I, I, I believe most people are trustworthy. I found it goes better in my life if I give everyone the benefit of the doubt. But when there's a really big issue like this, <laughs> you need to really do your research and do your due diligence to dig deep to, to make sure the person you're dealing with, like this is, this is a, it's a big transaction, right? It's a major life decision when you're hiring an advisor. Broker check. Just remember, broker check. All right, let's uh, take some calls again. Let's talk with Grace. Grace, you're with Allworth's Money Matters. Hello. Hi, Grace. Um, I am a California State Retirement System employee, and I'm planning to retire in 2022, late 2022 or early 23. At the time I retire, I'll probably have 11 weeks of um, unused vacation, and I'll receive a lump sum payment with my final check. Mm-hmm. If I'm retiring December 31st of 22 and I take that final check, I understand I will not be eligible for the CPI that goes into effect January 1 of 23. And if I take the check in 23, then I would, um, and retire in 23, then again, I'm, or I'm sorry, if I do it in December of 20. Uh, 21 or 22, I would get a CPI yep. increase mm -hmm. in January. You're, you're, yeah. Otherwise, I miss this. Don't get the CPI increase. So my question is: and I, I is think that has to do. To it has to do with on January 1st. If you had if you had been receiving a pension, you're going to get the the increase. 
if you hadn't been received, then you're a brand new pensioner, so you're not going to get an increase because you're brand new to the system, right? That's correct. Yeah, okay. Yes, yeah. So my question is, is it better to take that lump sum and forego one of the CPI increases or to um, take uh, to wait and, and go early and get the lump sum in the year that I have a higher um, salary or wages or, or how much is what percentage of your of your income will your your pension uh, replace ballpark um probably about 50 all right and b- by the way those aren't the only two options all right you can take you have 11 weeks you can actually t- spend the last five weeks of work on vacation and pay out the six weeks as a lump yeah, sum. Yeah, she's just thinking from a tax standpoint. Correct. So her thought is from a tax standpoint, she waits, retires January of the following year. That 11 weeks is going to be paid out. That's essentially going to be her only income for that year other than her pension. Are you married? I am, yes. And is your husband retired? He is retired and does receive Social Security. Um, and I will be 65 when I retire. So my second piece to the question would be, am I better to then immediately take my Social Security at 65 when I retire 65 in some months or wait till 66 and a half after reading your um, <laughs> recent article about Social Security, take it quick? I'm questioning that. And what's your family income at retirement? So let's just say that you retired um, on the 29th of December, what would the family income be for the following? By the following? way, it, by, by the way With, uh, Grace without, was just referring to an article that is on our website. Um, it's a featured article on, yes, Social Security is on the brink. So, Yes. Um, without my Social Security, it will be about 93000 a year. And then if you add my Social Security, it goes up to about 126 or 27 So for tax purposes, it doesn't really matter. It's the CPI, right? Which is what... I, I think so. Yeah, I think unless um, at that 96, if I don't take the, um, if I still get a standard deduction and I don't take the um, my Social Security that first year, it would offset the Social Security. This qu- this, so it would be much easier for us to answer this question if we were sitting in September of 2022. Yes. Right. So right we now we know what like, the tax situation is. And we know be. what the CPI and, and, looks yeah, like. Yeah. Inflation, you're kind of paying attention to, which you might not have a year ago, but all of a sudden, whoa. Yeah. So the answer to your question is we have no idea. Because, of the, because the, <laughs> we don't know. We because don't know. The decision's if, too far out. We don't know if the taxes are going to change. And we don't. Right now, if inflation stays close to z- zero, which it's not. I mean, it is absolutely inflation is here. I could tell you how he would answer it if we needed to make the decision next month. But you're asking me to make a decision for the year 2022. And the good news is, regardless of which way you go, it's not going to have it's going to have a negligible impact in your retirement. But but I love the way you're thinking. I do, too. I mean, you are 100 percent right on and you're thinking this is exactly how I, I've been. <laughs> I was trained to think this way. And this is exactly the kind of thing. We, I, I look at all the options. right? Yeah, but but we're too early in the process to actually because we don't have all the, the factors. Right. We're trying to solve for X and we don't know Y and Z is. So in summer of 22, I should be looking at what's the CPI rate running at that point what yes. what does it look like it's doing if it's an inflationary cpi it could be very much That's very right. beneficial and what do you know what what 12 sure month what that. you know what 12 month period they use to to give the increase what that trigger I, date is know, I, there must be some date they I, publish it yeah it's it's probably i mean i would guess that it's probably the end of the third quarter but i that's a pure guess that would be my guess and they, they give an increase beginning in the January, like the right beginning of the next year? Correct. Every yeah. January 1st. So okay. you'd want to make the decision as soon as you knew what that number was. Odds are you're going to, odds are you're going to retire in December, that, if I were that, a betting man. That would be my guess. Okay. But, but, that, but I love the way you're thinking. I, I mean, good for you. Are you an analyst for the state, by the way? I am not. Okay. Oh, well, you should be. <laughs> you should be. The state would be in much better shape <laughs> well, no. have people like you run yeah, the numbers. You should not be, as a taxpayer in the state of California, I do not want you to retire, Grace. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's happening. Yeah. Yeah. In the state of California, we think things can't get a little more crazy. Uh, and by the way, what you do have an option, do you have a, access to both a 401k and a 457 right now? I do. And are you using them both? Um, I am using 
one of them. The other one I just put dollars aside in a, a Roth on my own because I don't like the investment options for the state. Under, one option you could do, though, is is you can f- determine so that your 11 weeks of vacation, that dollar amount goes into the 457 plan. You retire the next month, the dollars come out into an IRA. IRA. So you have you have some flexibility because you have both plans available. That's to a you. way. That is actually a way that you can take that vacation in 2022 and have it taxable to you in 2023 if you so desire to, or 2024, or 25, or six, or, six or, or seven. So what but, I would be doing is if I was sitting at the you asked one question, I'm going to answer a completely different one. If I was sitting in a room with you as a financial advisor, I would be looking to take that income that vacation, assume we were going to hit it all in that same year and figure out how we could defer a hundred percent of that using the deductibility of both the 457 and 401k throughout the year. Yes. Okay. Then, then we don't have to make this decision. We know to just retire in December. Yeah. And it's easy that way. That's some pretty good thinking right there. Yeah, You know, (laughs) thanks. Are Are you tracking grace? I am tracking. Yeah, so of course I she is. Have she should have been an analyst for folks, the state of California. I, I, I have heard that folks are doing, some folks do that where they take part of it in. Um, they take some of the cash or they vacation in the at the end of, you know, November, December. And then they take the other half and put it into their retirement you plan. Can, you can put all of it in because you have both. You're one of the rare uh, institutions in the United States that both has a 401k and 457. Which you can, means you can take, you can do Up twice as much. $46,000 a year into a tax deferral. And you don't like the investments, but it doesn't really matter because they're only going to be there for a, a few weeks. months. You're going to roll it out the following year into right. an IRA and, and buy anything you want. Right. So that's what I would play with. Okay. All right. Good luck, Grace. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Enjoy Thank retirement. You. Yeah, for sure. Perfect example of what financial planning looks like right there. That is the... Yeah. So if your investment advisor today that you've been working with doesn't have these kind of conversations with you, you've got, you've got an investment manager. You don't have a financial advisor. Correct. And, Perfect example. And I believe that value is brought in our industry through financial planning and, and invest- guidance and investments and proper investment allocations, not trying to outsmart the markets, not being able to pre- predict what the next Amazon is, which sometimes people look to their investment advisor to be able to somehow read the tea leaves or something. If your investment advisor could predict what the next Amazon would, they wouldn't have any clients. They wouldn't need them. <laughs> be a billionaire themselves. <laughs> right. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> I was going to say they'd be calling you from your, their yacht, but they wouldn't be calling. They, they wouldn't, wouldn't be, be talking, calling you. They would not be talking they'd to be you. be talking to the helicopter pilot. <laughs> where's, my, where's my ride? They're supposed to have four jet skis here. You know how my I'm, life is so tough. I've been in Monte Carlo almost a week, and I have yet to be invited to a private party. Have you on, been to Monte Carlo? I have not been to Monte I went Carlo. there. My son was uh, this right. summer in Nice, France. Okay. It's supposed to be a language school. I saw right. that. <laughs> right? I, I saw the. First of all, I saw the online brochure. There were cute girls on their bikes on, on, in Nice. I'm like, you're going for language school or what's this about? It's the language of love, Scott. <laughs> anyway, we're there. So I went to, to, to Monte Carlo, Monaco and all that. That is one of the strange... If you really love money and love material goods, that's the place for you. It's just, you know, you go to some places like... Wow. I mean, you, you, everyone's trying to outdo one another, right? And people live there because there's no taxes. And um, I, a, I mean, money is a tool to provide lots of things. I don't, how big a yacht do you, my dad always said, wherever you go, there you are. Yeah. Right? You, you got to take yourself with you. So nothing, things don't change a whole lot. Are there like Versace stores and not all over the place? I don't know. There's fancy stores. The, the size of the yachts are Oh. Some of these yachts, they have two. They've got a, another boat to, to haul their toys and stuff. Mm. It's just so strange. Mm. But by the way, most very wealthy people do not live that way. Yes. Most do not. Yeah. There's a lot of very quiet people that have $100 million, $200 million that you would never know. Yeah. And they want it that way. <clears throat> they want it that way. And they don't view that going out and buying more stuff is going to change anything from anyway i don't know why i got on the top let's talk to uh michael michael you're with all worth's money matters 
Hi, Scott and Pat. Hi. Great to talk to you today. Thank you. Yeah, so um, uh, last year, um, I, I think I accidentally retired. I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, I know it was a pandemic year, and you asked to shelter at home and all that stuff, <laughs> but, but <laughs> you just didn't log in, or what happened? <laughs> um, not, not exactly. Um, I, I did turn in my laptop on my last day of work, uh, that sort of thing. Um, so uh, my company offered a, a buyout in June. And, well, they, the, the offer dropped in June, and um, you know we had well, six weeks or something to make a decision. And um, <clears throat> so I, I started working with a fiduciary um uh, financial planner, um, you know, uh, at that time, um, and uh, ultimately made the decision to um, kind of walk away from my uh, corporate career. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, and, uh, you know, the analysis that was run at the time, you know, was kind of quick and dirty. You know, we didn't really build out, you know, a full financial uh, plan at that time, but this is, you know, the, the priority there then was to just kind of make a go, no go yep. decision. Um, so now, um, you know, um, quite a few months out from that, um, you know, <clears throat> I felt comfortable enough from, from the analysis to make that decision. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm trying to understand if I, you know, if I get the itch to go back to work, you know, it'll be to go back to work and not necessarily for the, for the money per se, I guess, but, okay. um, how so, old are you? So, uh, oh, um, <laughs> I'm 45, 45. 45. Yeah, yep, assume 45. you're going to assume you're going to go back to work. Make that assumption. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Why do you state that, Pat? What? Because how many people have you I've talked to many people that have retired at 45 and what they find out is there's no one to play with because all their friends in their age group actually have jobs. And unless you want to, you know, unless you want to join a seniors bowling league or a, a you know whatever the paddle ball I, I talked to a friend of mine this week. He was retired CHP, retired at age 50, full pension. Uh, then uh, opened up some coin-op laundromats. And he's got three or four different coin-op laundromats in various places. And he says to me the other day, I think he's 54, 55, something like that. He says to me the other day, he says, yeah, he says, all my laundromats are like fully operational. They don't need me anymore. He says, I got to find something else to, he says to me, I got to find something else to do. Like, I, it's just not healthy for me not having productive things to be working on. Yeah. And especially probably one of the reasons you could retire at 45 is you're probably highly productive at your job or you're just darn lucky. And I'm going to go with highly productive. Which one is uh, it? Yeah. Yeah. I, no, I, I, I feel like I was pretty, pretty darn productive. Um, it was it was stressful, um, and I and I ended up you know regardless I, I think I needed a change you know a right. change of, okay uh, and sometimes scenery. these buyouts are um, let, it's way. like the company's got to make some decisions like all right okay so the question for us is I'm going to go with the assumption that you're probably going to return to some sort of work between now and the day you die yes so what's your question for us and, and, well so. Um, you know, I, I have a portfolio and to be perfectly honest, I haven't really like focused on, I haven't tried to optimize on, um, either retiring or semi-retiring early. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to go back into corporate America with a six figure income again. So I, I, you know, maybe what I do you have work saved again, for retirement? Be... What do you have in all your retirement okay. savings? Okay, here we go. I've got, um, bottom line, and a... bottom line. Oh, everything's saved. Oh, number. Um, I've got um, in my little app that tracks it. It's, it's got a total net worth of two point nine million, but that includes three hundred k of home equity, okay. and um, I've estimated a pension that they're going to pay out. The net present value of that is about two hundred forty thousand. So, you know, ca call it um, two hundred or two point four million, let's say, of investable assets. And how much? And how big is your mortgage on your house? Uh, mortgage is two hundred and seventy-eight thousand. Okay. And left. Married? how much married kids? Ah, I am single, no kids, no say, dependents. There's, there's no, he's me. married with kids because he'd, he'd, he'd need to get out of the house. <laughs> That's right. That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> and and how much were you making at your job? So um, I was making about one twenty-five to one thirty. 
Um, but that was really, you know, I, I didn't start out making that much. What do you need? What do you think you need? How much do you need to live on? Uh, I think 80,000 is a decent number for me to live on. Um, you know, I, I had a pretty high savings right there towards the end when I was making those six figures. You can make it work on a couple caveats. One is that you need to be pretty disciplined on this portfolio. Yep. Because you don't, there's not a, there's not a lot of wiggle room. If we're talking about two and a half million dollars of investable assets, at um, three and a half percent distribution. Yeah, that's if you were at seventy-five at three and a half percent distribution, easy. super easy. You're forty-five. That's the one caveat. The second is be have a mindset that allows you to flex a little. So if we go through another period, if last twenty-five years we had two downturns where the stock market fell roughly half. Let's assume we'll have another period like that. We be be prepared so if we have another dismal time, that maybe you tighten the belt a bit during th- those seasons. And I would, and when things are going flush, don't be tempted to say, "Oh my gosh, I I made two hundred grand more than I thought I was going to be uh, taken." And I, if I were you, mm-hmm. I would not start a seventy-two T distribution out of, of IRAs or four hundred one ks. I would use any of the cash up first before I started a seventy-two T distribution. Okay, I, I did want to ask you about that. Um, I just figured with so the vast majority of the 2.4 in in investable assets is uh, but uh, 1.8 million of it is in a a 401k. Yeah, but I I would instead I would look at particularly the first couple years. Use your cash after tax assets to to Mm -hmm. fund your needs. Convert some to a Roth because you've got a great opportunity right now with your income being low, which is essentially the same thing about taking money out of your retirement. But now instead of taking it out. We're putting in a Roth IRA, which is much favorable uh, for you. If you were 55, maybe you could look at a 72T, but there's, there's so, many, so many years between now and, and 59 and a half even. That yeah, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't I, you don't know where you're going to land. It's all new to you. This retirement is from, you know, it's part of the FIRE movement. And most of those people that actually read about FIRE movement are actually working because they have their own Financially blogs. independent retire early. early. So anyway, That's appreciate so the call. And- I had this conversation with um, a friend today when I said, uh, I, am, I, ne- I hope to never retire. I hope you never retire either. Okay. Anyway, we're taking, and I have, we certainly help a lot of people who, who retire. We're out of time. And uh, anyway, it's been great being with you. Thank you for being part of Allworth Money Matters. We'll see you next week. This program has been brought to you by Allworth Financial, a registered investment advisory firm. Any ideas presented during this program are not intended to provide specific financial advice. You should consult your own financial advisor, tax consultant, or estate planning attorney to conduct your own due diligence.